Hey everybody, welcome back to the Petapixel podcast. It's your buddy Jordan Drake and I got other buddies here. Look, it's Chris Nichols. Hi. Or listen if you're just listening. And you can also listen to my friend Jaron Schneider. How are you doing, Jaron? I'm good. Thank you very much. All right. I'm bringing all the energy today. So- <laughs> <laughs> I so just I recovered like from to- about a COVID. So like, I mean, my oh, energy is no, on its way that. back up. Yeah, oh. in between the last podcast and this one, I, I went through the whole cycle and I'm, I'm feeling better. It's okay, but it was I'm the coughing, tenth time. He's he's fine. It was the second time, and if uh, if I'm coughing, <laughs> I apologize in advance because it's still a little bit of lingering. But I'm, I'm what's what's fine. your COVID ranking this time? Because I would oh, say it's, like it was like a head yeah. cold. It was okay. Weak. So like a two weak. out of ten kind of deal. Yeah. yeah okay. I, I laugh at COVID now. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're doing better. <laughs> Uh, so I always like to kick things off with a question for both of you, you know, uh, just uh, just to let everybody know us a little bit. He'll better. eventually run out, Chris. Eventually, no, he I will run out of things no, to ask. I don't know. Go forever. He has um, a superpower. So I actually have two questions this week. First question is, what is your spouse's pet name for you? And question two, can I call you that for the duration of the episode? Go ahead. Go ahead, Jaron. What, what does what does your wife call you? Jer. I can do Jer. Okay. I, I was hoping for something, uh, you know, a little more cuddly and affectionate. You but, uh, like can... Schnookums, baby? Like, no. <laughs> yes, I was, that's exactly what I was. That would be a <laughs> revelation <laughs> for me. <laughs> we don't really do the pet names thing. In fact, my wife hates it. Uh, like, hearing anyone's call someone else baby, uh, she hates it. She, like, like, cringes. So, I'm not even What? I call, call your wife that. baby all the time. No, you, you don't. Don't oh. say things like that. People will oh, believe okay. you, as I said last week. But yeah, no, it's uh, it's just Jer. Chris? Oh, uh, So uh, that's funny. Um, we don't do honey or anything like that, but my wife does call me babe or baby. That, that's so I, your, your wife would hate it. Okay, perfect. So so you're, are you cool with me calling you babe or baby for the duration? I mean, of this? you've called me so much worse. I, I'm fine with calling you baby. Yeah. What does your wife call you? Uh, you already know this, so oh, yeah. I'm just going to let you take the lead t- on this. <laughs> well, tell, the, tell the world, Jordan. Tell the entire world. She, she does sometimes call me Jordy Boo. <laughs> Jordy Boo, yes. Oh, yes. I have Actually, heard Chris call you that. I call, I call, so that answers your second question. I mean, whether you give me permission or not, I call you Jordy Boo all the time. Okay, I decline yeah. to give you permission for this particular No, uh, or Jord. She calls you Jord, and I call you Jord. Or Jordy Bear, and I call you Jordy Bear too once in a while. She calls you Jordy Bear more often. I know a lot about your guys' relationship. That's strange. You do. You've known us for a shockingly yeah, long time. long yeah. time. Hmm. Uh, but yes, Jordy, th- Jordy Boo's my personal favorite. I will continue to use that. I tend to be quite formal when I say people's names. Like, my wife's hmm. name is Andy, uh, but it's actually Andrea. Nobody calls her Andrea except me. Like I'll, wow. I, I say everyone's name like in full whenever possible. Like I actually like not just when you're mad at them. <laughs> no, just in general. I, had a, I have a I have a friend who's, who who goes by like his name's Pat, but I always call him Patrick. Like, oh, always. do you call me Christopher? I should. I think I. Oh, when he's when he's that. stern and you're not around, Chris. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sorry, babe. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we got a huge. Newsweek that has happened. So we're really going to focus on those stories today. I mean, the absolute headline that we want to really get into is Nikon has bought red. And I have mm-hmm. a lot of thoughts and the I'm primary sure there's plenty color. for us to discuss. Yes, exactly. They now <laughs> yeah, own they it. They bought an entire color. I yeah. just realized it's, I missed It's officially going to be a rainbow war. If you want to make orange, you've got to license it from Nikon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you've already I, got I feel access like all, to yellow. We should have, uh, we didn't think about this. I should have done yellow in my background Oh. And that way, yeah, Chris would be the red, and then we I'm would trying be to be yeah. For those that are watching, I'm trying to like be true to the nature of our oh, new even your shirt today. is on, on yes. theme. Yeah. Well done, yes. and my burning job, passion babe. for both of you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can listen to you call him babe. It's <laughs> 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 well, uh, why don't we just quickly intro this podcast as yeah. a palate cleanser, and we'll get into it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't be like that, baby. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Well, 
now that that is probably not behind us, but I'm going to keep moving forward. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank our podcast sponsor, OM System. Join OM System for Lens Fest. Now, through March 31st, you'll find incredible discounts on nearly all M Zuiko Pro lenses that are now $200 off, plus unlock savings of up to $400 on most non-pro M Zuiko lenses, along with exclusive camera and lens bundle deals. Out of curiosity, for each of you, yeah. mm. what is your favorite OM System Pro lens? Oh, and what is I your had fa- this favorite? Cute, I was I was teed up oh. to ask you guys the same question. Mine's easy. <laughs> Eight to well, twenty-five f four. That lens yeah. rules ultra wide to normal range. It's got a focus clutch on it. It barely breathes at all, and it's a wonderfully sharp photography lens. That lens slaps and rules, and everyone should have one. Man, yes. you you're very violent with your lenses. They're always slaps. being tyrannical and abusive. Rules. Yeah, yeah. They Jeez. they slap and they're killer <laughs> lenses. Yeah. Uh, my favorite, probably you guys already know, it's the Olympus 12 to 100 f4 Pro. I love that lens. It's rugged for outdoor use, very versatile, optically actually really nice. The only thing I would say is it doesn't focus super close, but I love it for like on river video work, and it's it's just a great walk around travel lens. All right. What it's about funny, your favorite like big F4 emphasis here today? That's going to roll yeah. back later in the episode. <laughs> oh, what about yeah. your favorite non-pro lens? Your favorite, just your standard uh, OM system lens. M Zuiko, I should say. It's a lot of branding stuff with with OM. So. You know, I mean, the 12 mil. It was always a sexy little lens. You know, yeah, the old the school 12 F2. mil. Yeah, and uh, beautiful. Like I liked it when you could. get, I mean, that's you know, that's we're talking Olympus days, but it's uh, you could get in silver body. Really nice metal construction. That was a beautiful little walk around lens. Okay, so let me just check this. I have it right beside me here. The uh, 75 mil 1.8, one of my favorite yes. lenses, is not a pro series lens. So that would definitely qualify. There you go. Just like the 12 mil, yeah. uh, same like kind it, of generation, same yeah, kind of series. If, if you're looking to do like candid photography and something, 150 millimeter equivalent, keep your distance, but really bright and just lovely fall off on it. This lens is wonderful. Well, it, it, it slaps and burns oh, and fights and, and rages and aggressive. Owns. Yes, yes, it, it owns. owns hard. Well, OM Systems' renowned legacy in cutting-edge optics shines through with the line of compact, lightweight lenses delivering impeccable image quality. Designed for adventure and many built to withstand any environment, the M Zuiko Pro series of lenses are not only durable, but also weather-sealed for peace of mind in every shooting scenario. Don't miss out on LensFest. Upgrade Mm -hmm. your gear during one of the biggest lens sales of the year. For more information, visit explore.omsystem.com slash petapixel. Thanks again to OM System for sponsoring the Petapixel podcast. Thank you. So I, I want to bring something up here. So, I mean, we've heard now Nikon is buying red, the color red. And the Nikon's color has always been yellow, right? But they always they always like rock the red stripe. So, I mean, that makes sense. But Olympus used to own blue. But OM mm-hmm. System, have you guys noticed they don't have a color anymore? Do they like... Well, the lenses, own- the Zuiko lenses still have the blue ring. Do they sell the blue ring? Like that's yeah. so that's oh Olympus slash OM Systems color. What but does they Canon? T- they do? tend to be like leaning more into like the blacks now because I've got some like business cards. Yeah, from them. yeah. Canon that's does the mean. red, which is why they yeah. were in cahoots with red before and shared a lens mount. Yeah, but Canon's not like. Does Canon have to change the color of their logos now? I don't know. Sony's orange, right? Like everybody seems to have their color that they Fuji's like. Fuji's green. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fuji's green. Yeah. So. Well, Fuji uses red a lot actually. <laughs> Like that's the, true too. The the yeah, little like the red eye in Fujifilm, right? So, right. But I think green, green is, their is color. more. I think it's their broadcast series that tends to use the the Fujinon lenses. Like, yeah, right. Those use green. But like their film more. packs were always green, right? Like that's their their analog stuff. So I don't know. Like yeah, Olympus. I feel like the Ohm system now they've kind of let go of the blue. You don't see it very often now anymore. So they should embrace that blue. I like the blue. Everybody's got to jump on a color now. I don't know. Well, Can, I don't before, know before we do. get to discussing the primary colors uh, that are purchased by Nikon, um, <laughs> let's let's first go through some of the other stuff that happened this week. And we're going to start with the one that that really broke this week. And Ooh. I'm going to preface this with this is not a story that is like should be on the cover of People magazine or whatever. This is actually like if you want if you're going to skip this. Uh, I, I really, I really hope that you don't, because there's, there's a discussion around this that I want to get to. It's just you can get really derailed by the the subject matter yes, very quickly, because yes, people yes. just don't, like, tend to not care. But yesterday, so on Monday, we record this podcast on Tuesdays. Uh, Kate Middleton, a photo that she had shared with media, so she had sent this through the wire, that is to say, through official channels to like AP and Reuters and the BBC and whatnot, um, was found to have been digitally manipulated in some way which is not allowed per those 
publications rules. Yes. And the AP had to send out a kill order to remove it from circulation, which is extremely rare. Mm-hmm. And so CNN is now saying that they they looked at this and are now reviewing every other handout photo they've received <laughs> from them from Kensington Palace, which is like their, you know, whatever, what they use yeah. is their, their, their PR. Their PR firm, so to speak, yeah. Yeah, and it's just like, this is a bigger deal than I think people realize because the idea that photos can be manipulated and that it aren't necessarily inherently true isn't something that enthusiasts, like photography enthusiasts, have questioned. We've all yeah. known that. And like the whole idea behind content authenticity, that whole conversation has been going on now for a couple of years. But the average person doesn't really think about it that much. Yeah. They think about it now. They A lot of people, <laughs> like our editor, uh, Matt Grokut's mother-in-law, is just incensed. Like, she feels right. lied to. And I think that this is a major turning point in that discussion. Thoughts, yeah, this, gentlemen? This is an interesting discussion. <clears throat> Sorry, because... the the. Your normal reaction when you see the photo, I mean, just to give context, if you haven't seen it, it's Kate Middleton with her kids. It's a nice, like, very standard sort of family portrait, well-produced, nice light, right? And I think Kate Middleton fancies herself a bit of an amateur photographer and an enthusiast as well. And I mean, so it's a nice photo. And and there's nothing, you know, we're not talking about anything that's going to change political uh you know situations or or put anybody in trouble or be taken out of context or anything like that but i think most people when they look at a photo like this they're like well what's the big deal it's a family yeah. shot like why exactly. can't kate edit it why can't she change it like who cares that seems to and, be a and, purveying comment on petapixels like why do we care it's just a photo of a family leave her alone exactly and 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 you know what and i'm going to say this 100 percent. that's not an invalid statement to make okay like yes we have to consider the context that it is a family photo if there was any changing or compositing it was probably to like get someone like everybody smiling or, or, you know, minor correction to some sort of detail. But that's also not the point, right? Like, yes, it's a family photo. It it won't have any political ramifications or anything like that. It's not going to tarnish anybody's reputation. At the same time, though, we are talking about something that's going through journalistic outlets. And that's the key. It's not an Instagram post. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is the context is extremely important here and that she's kind of been invisible from the public eye for a while. People are concerned about her well-being. And this is the first photo that's been released in a while. And then to have that doctored, just it just feeds fire to the whole like, oh, just the British conspiracy. Yeah, exactly. Something You're you're getting all those people riled up as well. Yes, I feel like the intent of this was the opposite of that. The intent of this picture was to show that everything's fine. But all it did was the the exact opposite. Now everyone's like, is everything fine? So it's like Uh, it. all of that to me matters less. It also doesn't matter to me like like any of the stuff surrounding the royals. I don't care. Well, what I care yeah. well, about. These are our monarchs, Jared. Exactly. Easy. Okay. You're talking to two and Canadians. Excuse me. Yeah. They're still on our money, don't say Darren. Our, you guys had a war. Un- we had a peaceful transition to power. Okay. <laughs> like there's a difference here. All right. I think the, the, that's the takeaway though. Not, not the peaceful transition to power. The fact that the, that it was sent out as an official press image and mm-hmm. it was doctored. And that's that's the yeah. issue here. And that combined with the fact that it's with a very popular, well-known, uh, I was going to say political, but not really, pop culture figure um, that most people are aware of is why right. this is overarchingly important. Yeah, um, I and have had- to remember like, AP and Reuters, like for people that don't know, they have inc- they have to have incredibly strict standards. I mean, journalists are held to an incredibly high account. There cannot be any major editing to photographs. Certainly, no compositing, no no uh, airbrushing, no clone stamping. Like you know, and that's clearly what's what's been shown in this photo. I mean, there's some cloning, there's some bad compositing. Yeah. So, you know, you cannot do that for journalistic newsworthy photos. It's a yeah. breach of trust. It, it's like exposure it's, and white balance, basically. Yeah. That they'll allow you to mess around with. Yeah, you, for you anyone who can't who, even crop very much, like it's it's a very very strict yeah. rule set. For anyone who might say, "Well, what if it was taken by a smartphone?" Because those can do that too. It wasn't. Uh, the Verge has reported that they had the original file and they got the metadata out of it and said that it was a five D Mark three or four and it was edited in a version of Photoshop that doesn't even have AI in it. So this was done by hand. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's it. I'm that's all I wanted to say. I mean, I mean, I mean this is why people- we need. 
So yeah, this is why we need content. cameras with content, uh, you know, authenticity initiative stuff in it. Shitty's we we need like to have. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember saying that, right? Why did they show an M11 uh, P? Yeah, I mean, this is why this is important so that the news journalists, uh, the, sorry, the journalistic uh, companies can see what changes have been made and then automatically they wouldn't even make it to press, right? Like right. this would have been stopped way it earlier. Been flagged immediately. Been like, yeah, right. exactly. Right? Even if it didn't have content authenticity credentials and the AP was requiring it, they're part of the group, but they're not currently requiring that it be embedded with uh, the yeah. C whatever c2pa cp2 yeah. i can't remember i always get the letter and the number mixed up but like they aren't requiring it yet but had they this wouldn't have b- had it in there no. and they would have rejected it i think yeah. this is probably going to push that yeah. fast and then matthew's M- matthew's mother-in-law would have been okay you know she well i think she's happy. an interesting case study in that like you said jaren this is bringing awareness of this issue to the people who are just like flipping through a tabloid and it's like what's going on with this doctored image it's making them aware of these images being doctored potentially in the news yes like our parents going to start demanding they might not be like i demand c2pa certification but they might certainly be like is this coming from you know if if they hear there is an authorized uh way to label an image then they might start demanding that even if they don't understand the technical side of it it's scary and tough because i mean you know the conspiracy theory theorists and and stuff that really starts to go and then people distrust the media more which is i think very bad it's like we need to be able to trust our media sources so that's why this story is really important no matter where you fall on what side of the fence on it it's like it's important that we understand that being able to trust what we're seeing and be able to then trust the media and and understand that as a truth i think that's critical and so that's what we're working towards not us but you know the global photographic community Mm -hmm. is to try to make this so that you don't have these thoughts and you don't have to feel like, oh, am I being lied to or is this actually the truth? I mean, that's the whole point. So yeah, it could be a turning point. Could be. All right. It's enough, Kate Middleton. Let's talk about uh, third party lenses <laughs> on Canon. So as part of our series of uh, interviews we did with camera companies in Japan, and by we, I mean me, uh, Canon told me that they are about 50% of the way through negotiations with third-party lens manufacturers to bring autofocus third-party lenses to the RF mount. Yay! So, what do you guys think about this? Like, it's how old is the RF mount now? <laughs> yeah, I'm like five years old at this point. And I mean, like halfway through the negotiations, I'm very curious what all that entails because I, I would hope it would be like, pay us a small licensing fee and you can release your lenses sure. on our mount. And then, um, I mean, this is going to touch into a story later in this episode, but I know looking at the comments and just being aware of like the photographic community, Canon has a real image problem right now. And this is the main thing everyone's talking about. So they have to get this thing sorted out. Uh, You know, even if people aren't buying third party lenses, they need to feel that they have the option. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, frankly, they're the one mount where they really do need affordable, they varied need the lenses. They need the mid-range. It's yeah. cheap lenses or insanely premium lenses. There's yeah. nothing in between. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, one of the other things that came from this interview was essentially, I asked them, like, why has it taken you so long? Like, why has is Canon the only camera manufacturer that does not allow third-party lenses? And uh, you can read the quote on Petapixel. I, I'll link to it in the description below, as I always do. But essentially, it comes down to uh, because money. Mm-hmm. They sure. basically just straight up said, and it makes sense. I'm glad they were honest. Like they're, they're, this kind of frankness in in this type of discussion is rare. But they essentially said we could make more money by selling our own lenses on our own mount and stopping yep. anyone else from doing that. So yeah. that's what we did. And like <laughs> the photographer doesn't want to hear that. No. And I and I kind of sympathize with them. I do think that especially when Canon, I feel like, gained the most momentum in the digital photography age was because of the just breadth of EF lenses. Yeah. The fact that now we're in RF and that is not the case just feels very jarring to anyone who shot Canon for two decades or yeah. whatever. So, I mean, I get where they're coming from, but I, I don't love it. And I and I do think that they probably do feel that pressure now. It's finally yeah, like absolutely. They, yeah. it's finally reached the boardroom. Where they we feel like can't, they have to have that discussion. We can't discuss a Canon product without that being like the most upvoted <laughs> thing is, yeah. you know, we oh. release a Canon lens review and it's like, well, you better love it because you don't have any option from <laughs> yeah, third I mean, parties. <laughs> exclamation, Chris, Chris's exclamation. section of are there alternatives is always no. No. 
Yeah. There's no alternatives. Straight up, yeah, the, straight up. Uh, there's no alternatives. Yeah. BF lens with worse optics on there. I guess that's your yeah. alternative. We don't even consider yeah. that an alternative. <laughs> like it, it would be the same as saying the alternative would be to buy a Sony camera and have these alternative lens options. That's like the same the same general. Yeah, adapt your EF me. lens onto the Sony body as well, right? Yeah. 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 You know, I, I'm always curious about what actually goes on in the back end. I mean, these negotiations must be interesting, but you remember the SLR days, of course, third-party manufacturers made lenses for pretty much all the mounts. Manual focus, it was easier, no big deal. But, you know, I, I always wonder, like, back in the day, we always heard stories of how the manufacturers, the third-party manufacturers would reverse engineer everything. Like, it wasn't like they had permission. It was really just like, uh, let's figure out how we can make their autofocus work with our Correct. system. And, and Canon just and, allowed it. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, the, but I feel like there was always this constant struggle and battle. And so I, then it sort of seemed to be in the mirrorless world, more a spirit of cooperation. I mean, Sony got a lot of good press for that, where they're like, oh, we're actually sharing our, our, our algorithms calls, yeah. and our software and our connection points and stuff to the manufacturers so that we can make stuff that works. That was, that was kind of unheard of. So I've always been curious now, like how friendly are these relationships? Obviously with Canon, it shows there is Not some friendly. antagonism based mostly off money but you know how friendly are they how willing are they to divulge technology and to share mounts but at the same time you got like l mount alliance where they're like yeah let's do this as an actual thing so it's a, it's an interesting turning point and i think a big part of that is because the third-party manufacturers have really grudgingly earned a lot of people's respect oh, yeah. yeah would i buy a camera that i can't put a tamron 35 to 150 on no absolutely not. right yeah your favorite yeah. lens next to the olympus 75 18 very different beasts, both wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, on this same note, I, I, I wanted to discuss this later because I didn't want to spend too much time on Canon, but I think it's a better segue here. So we'll move to it now. Uh, Canon recently had like a, like a, I don't know, it's not like shareholders meetings, like a corporate strategy summit. And right. one of the guys that I spoke to in Japan, Go Tokura or Tokura Go, um, presented and said, that Canon has a goal in the next two years, and that is to achieve the overwhelming number one share of the mirrorless market. And mm. they want, like, the language was strong. Like, they said, absolute, establish the absolute position. Like, they, they don't want to be, like, unquestionably the best. And <laughs> that sell the most on, cameras. Uh, rebuttal there really got under there. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> really pissed them Sony. off, I guess. Yeah, or yeah Sony, they really I mean, didn't yes. like the, yeah. they didn't like the Sony battle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... What do you think? Is, does, is this a reasonable goal? Like, here's the stuff that before I ask you, I guess, that, yeah. here's what they, they point to. They are basically saying they want to have the entire EOS lineup be competitive across the market. And in, on top of that, they're going to focus very strongly on preparing for VR, which is something they said to me in the, our, our meeting in Japan prior to this. Like, they are thinking about VR. Like, when we talked about the Apple Vision Pro, like, they need to develop a better sensor and better optics because they believe the best way to make content for that is with a single camera not a dual camera system um and i think you agreed right jordan for, yeah absolutely least, it's yeah. just it's much easier for the average consumer and i mean we should say too they're the only company making inroads on this because they have yeah. you know it might not hit the spec for apple vision pro but they do have a product for producing vr so do you think that in the next two years canon has the ability to become the overwhelming number one mirrorless company that's i mean it's always great when companies make these statements, right? Because you're basically putting your face on the line. And uh, and, and so uh, that would be great. Uh, more competition is always good. That being said, I mean, you know, VR is cool and everything, but I think it's still a fairly early small market. What Canon has to do is have a really big year this year with new releases. So it's great that they're promising that and, and they're very hush-hush. I mean, Maybe more than any other company, Canon are always uh, very sort of closed, secretive, quiet until launches come out. Um, they've always sort of had that. I've always felt that in the industry for like decades. And uh, they'd really have to explode, right? I mean, we like we said, third party, that's going to be a great option. I think that's a good move. But how long is that still going to take to finalize and then produce lenses for? Uh, and on top of that, Canon has kind of the oldest lineup, right? I mean, the R5, uh, the R6 Mark II is nice. They did they did increase their APS-C line, but obviously people want to see whatever this R1 is going to be like if that ever comes out on the Olympics year. Uh, people want to see a new R5. So I don't know. We're going to have to see Canon really have a big year this year with big launches to really, I think, back up that claim. 
I think it's really interesting they touch on as well, like security and industrial. I mean, that's a huge growth area. And obviously that doesn't rely on photography still being popular, right? Uh, which is a big thing on it. Like I do, I, I am concerned a little bit about on the photography side, just again, because of the perception that people have for it. But as well, they really lean on like cinema in this. And I mean, if the news that we're going to talk about later, you know, about Nikon really pushing in there in a huge way, um, it's going to be a lot more competitive in that kind of, you know, these aren't going to be competing with Aries. It's that mid range space, you know, that right. 10,000 to $20,000. A um, lot of cameras. camera is going to get, <laughs> yes, exactly. Very competitive in there. And that might really slow their growth on that. So I, I'm curious. I mean, Canon's always been bullish. Anytime we talk to them, we're like unquestionably number one, uh, number one. But a lot of the time I do wonder like, are they, you know, Sony seems to be moving a lot of models as well. Yeah. There is some question there. So I can see why they'd want to just, Silence that completely, not get a PR response from Sony when they say they're number one. But like, uh, does, but I don't <laughs> get the vibe from the photography community that I had 10 yeah. years ago when it was like, oh, Canon is unquestionably number one. And then there's number some one. other fun yeah. brands out there. Yeah, I mean, does a, does an industrial barcode scanner count as a mirrorless camera? I don't right? think so. No. Does, does a video camera count as a mirrorless camera, like a cinema eh, camera? More, yeah. more so than a barcode scanner. You know, <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like, you know, where does that claim come from? Right. If we're talking, if like, you're I saying agree with this, Jordan. This is essentially, it has to be the creative space. The like, creative space, yeah. They, they want to win there. Now, they're, they're, they, like, Canon is far more like yeah. uh, diverse in its investments in imaging than a lot of the other companies are. Yeah. So like, it makes sense that they're going to mention their other stuff, but like two of the four points that they had in this presentation were pretty exclusive to RF. Like, so it's, it's, you, you gotta good. look at it from that perspective. So like, that's their goal. Uh, I feel like they need to work on the image problem. They need to open them out and they need to have lenses start to become available uh, sooner rather than later for this right. to actually be able to happen. Right. That and have bodies that are more modern. Um, I like the R3, but it, it most people don't. I, I think it will be a big year for Canon. Like, I don't want to be cynical, but I think it actually will be a very no, big year for Canon, but I also think it better be a big yeah. year. <laughs> if they do the R1 and R5 too, that'll actually be very compelling. And then, yeah. I mean, yeah. we can't also, no, 2025 can't be silent either. The next two mm -hmm. years have to be significant. Sure. For them. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, 2023 right. was a bummer for them. Go ahead. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, they yeah. had some lenses and that was it. It was just really quiet. Um, all right, so let's move on, talk about a different company. Uh, Fujifilm doubled the manufacturing <laughs> capacity for the X106 versus the X105, and yeah. it still wasn't enough. They can only make 15,000 of them per month, which means that they believe they are months from being able to fulfill current orders day, like day one orders camera. even is yeah. the impression i'm hearing yeah yeah it's it's rough to get this camera uh i don't know that's all i had for this first part <laughs> if you got it's, any thoughts on this <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't know it's like is that a bad thing for fujifilm i you know i mean everybody's like oh this sounds negative but i think fujifilm no. loves it no this and is great for them they're gonna it's be great on, for them. in the news for the next three months of people like when yeah. they're going to how long will it take to get my camera it's All free press yeah and I everybody would. everybody is just like oh it's got to be so good that i must have it too right like that it that kind so of mindset good. is so prevalent in today's culture <laughs> in so. this case it's true though <laughs> it is oh, <laughs> except for you know if you don't like 35 millimeter maybe not but like. it's a perfectly fine camera it's great uh but no i i just <laughs> I just think it's it's playing out very well to them. It's giving everybody else FOMO, and and so they they start piling on the pre orders, and so yeah, good for Fuji. I mean, this is uh, it's wild, and and, and it we were kind of wondering like, oh, made in China. I mean, that's going to double their production or you know improve their production, and it has. So it's good to have that rec that that confirmation. But uh, at the same time, that doesn't seem to be slowing anybody. That doesn't seem to be turning anybody off. So, yeah. yeah, no, I don't. I, I think that this went over exactly as they had hoped, where they can make yeah. more of them, uh, probably at better margins, yeah, and still not be able to sell them fast. Enough. And it'll still like, be the hottest camera in yeah, the world for the rest of, of this year. If I was a business and I'm making a product, and I know for the next three to six months that everything <laughs> I make will be sold, oh, I'm very killer. Thumbs up, happy. Yeah, yeah, we're talking millions of dollars. Yep, happy. Yeah. Um, on this note, I wanted to ask you guys, do you think it is possible for any camera brand to replicate this level of popularity? Oh. I do want to point out one Rico seems to think so. A lot of folks forget about Rico Pentax, yeah. but 
the GR3 can't stay in stock either. So those are two right. premium compact cameras that fly off store shelves that Rico just basically, it's been rumored that they were having production problems, keeping up with production since last year. Yeah. They just last week said, yeah, we can't, we can't even take more orders <laughs> We're stopping orders until we fulfill. So they're, right. they're, they're in a worse position as far as like manufacturing capacity than Fujifilm is with a right. camera that's five years old. So besides these that's two who true. seemingly have cracked the code, can anyone else do this? Yeah, of course they could. And, and it's funny, like Nikon killed the Coolpix A line. I keep giving them a hard time about this, a fixed lens APS-C compact, because uh, it wasn't that hot, you know, back in, when did that come out? Eight years oh, ago man, or something like, like that. So long ago. Yeah. Like a um, decade. I, it was a long time. Not a decade, but, but pretty they, And they absolutely have the heritage for it too. Just do like a Nikon style rangefinder. I, any of these companies, if they did it. I bet if Sony re-released the RX1 series again right now would be perfect timing for it. Even if it's like a right. $4,000 camera, who cares? People will take that over waiting, you know, six months for the Fuji body. And I mean, the Leica Q3 as well has been hugely yeah. uh, popular already. So there, there's yeah, definitely, yeah. that's My the bad. other one too. Yeah. I forgot about the Q3. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I know you He's like that camera. Everywhere. I personally don't like that camera. Very that camera, you're great. crazy. Have, have you you're ever crazy. tried manually focusing with that camera, chair? Oh my god! But it's but it's not for everybody, right? I mean, an X106 or me. Ricoh GR3 is more accessible for most people. Hmm. I mean, Nikon Nikon's a good example, but they the Coolpix A died because they were like not sexy cameras at all. Yeah, uh, no retro I, heritage. Yeah, they they were just bricks. And uh, I, I feel the same like thing about the RX1. Is that the one yeah. they made? It, it, it was a good camera that just was not fun. The RX1 was not that sexy a camera either, but it it was full frame and that was really exciting, right? I mean, it was it was a full frame with a good lens on it. And so that part great was really focal exciting. Length. Yeah, what was, yeah. What was and it? I mean, the GR3 has got a great focal length. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's what I, I, I wrote a story about this today. And I think I, I just want to read this paragraph because it, it it's my thoughts on this. Right. With the growth of capability in smartphone camera technology, just about every camera company completely divested from developing compact cameras since the market appeared to no longer want them. That is at least what the balance sheets showed. But right. there's more to it than that. Prior to the smartphone, Circuit City, Best Buy, CompUSA, and every electronics store was filled to the brim with cheap, low-quality compact cameras. There is a bit of nuance there that most of these manufacturers missed. It's not the photographers didn't want compact cameras but rather they no longer wanted bad compact cameras. Yeah. And I think the only ones who really registered that are the ones that are now like full of success. Yeah. And companies like Canon, Nikon, Sony, uh, and even OM who I want them to bring back the gosh darn pen. Yeah. A lot of people do. Yeah. They, they don't I talk to do. them and they're just still like, I'm not sure anyone would buy that. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? Yeah. They'd have to make it good though. Like, yes. Just, <clears throat> and again, you have heritage. Every, just make it like something you just, just make it fun. Yeah. But everybody's got different concepts. Like everybody's going to have a different concept of what camera they like and how they handle. I mean, I love the GR. I had film GRs. They were amazing. The digital GRs. I don't know. There's stuff about the menu and stuff that just kind of turned me off. I'm not, and it's not, that's nothing wrong with, with Pentax and Rico. That's really me. Like personally, I just don't gel with them. Uh, it took me a while to fall in love with the X100 series, but the, the OM, like the Olympus, not OM, but the Olympus pens, I never thought that they were like finished cameras. That's funny. Kind of, a lot of my friends and me uh, personally, and they, my friends are not like hardcore photographers. They're all just like, like, you know, yeah. below level of enthusiast, all loved the pen. Yeah. And uh, yeah, many can't understand why they're not available in the US anymore. Well, I Chris and I really them. butted up against the pen because it was released after the EM5 too, but the autofocus was worse. And that was yeah. just like as a value proposition, it's more money for worse yeah. autofocus. But if you look at it in terms of the design, I mean, if they dropped like a pen with a three prime bundle of like small F1.7, 1.8 lenses, you know, maybe like put a, yeah. a, a new finish on it, sell it for $2,500, I think it would just blow up. I just feel like it wasn't a very sexy body. Like it's beautiful style. Beautiful body. They can, but it's like they, it was like a blocky, just like yeah, like they can fix it. It didn't though. feel nice to hold. I think they, they could make something really they sexy. Can that, yeah, there's yeah. a way to do it. Like Canon and Nikon also have a history in, in that they can sure. tap back in. Sony's got Minolta's heritage. Like 
all of them have something that they can look back on and be like, okay, we're going to make something fun. And that's yeah, the other Yeah, the are great cameras, but they're not sexy. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I feel yeah, like Sony true. has an opportunity to make like a, like a totally fresh novel design. And Nikon, I mean, they could draw off their SP heritage, their yeah. S-series rangefinders. I'm looking that right now, and I don't know. I, I think the Minolta film cameras have a have a something going for them. Well, I, think I mean, and that's neat. fine, and you're entitled to it. Not everybody can be right, Jaron. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Well, uh, they, they, yeah. it looks like they even have like a rangefindery looking thing. Like, come on. The, this the is better thing, better than the, than the characterless <laughs> Sonys we've been getting. <laughs> the other thing that's really odd is Panasonic gained its legitimacy as a camera manufacturer, I think, with the GF1, where like we had every pro be like, oh, I want that as a little second body with a 20 millimeter lens. And they've completely forgotten that. They went to the, you know, GM1, GM five that might have been even too small but they've forgotten that little mid-range and i would love to see that yeah. in both l and micro this is a cool looking return. camera you know their their classic range finders are pretty sexy uh, uh, yeah i am remembering that now but the, the rest of the Minolta? Ours, come on yeah Minolta, yeah, yeah. Thank, okay yeah. thank you for yeah. like, and i mean they, you know they your, have this partnership with the cl partnership with the cl and stuff like i yeah i get it i'm but, looking uh, at the gf1 and i think this is actually kind of a neat looking camera love yeah. the gf1 so although i would argue i would argue that any like classic silver slash black leatherette rangefinder from the 60s and 70s is kind of inherently sexy yeah. honestly so if you have one in your history book as a company yeah. just re-release it it's yeah. not that hard just style but it does, the sony, does sony really want to pull off their minolta heritage it does like, not seem to me like they I do don't think even so. though they should I, I, yeah i think they should i want to talk design. about that a little bit later uh for sure it's gonna roll yeah. into another topic here okay oh, all right so okay. then we'll move on then uh, to our Big main, story. main news story, the one that I'm sure all of you wanted to hear uh, Chris and Jordan's opinion on. Out of nowhere, surprising just about everyone. Like 1130 at night. I'm just yeah. on the couch <laughs> and I am look at my phone and it's like, what in the... And I start texting you two yeah, immediately. Yeah, they kept it secret. Nikon acquired Red in what <laughs> we argue is a massive shakeup in the cinema camera market. Jordan... Why don't you lead us off here? Yeah. Let's talk about this. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, first of all, the scope of this, we haven't seen an acquisition like this, I'd argue, since Sony bought Minolta. And that's why I said we're going to touch on it a little bit later. Do you remember like Sony's photographic reputation before that was like high megapixel bad cameras? And then following that, Sony has become, you know, bouncing back and forth with Canon over number one place in uh, the photo world. Right. So it absolutely gave them a real legitimacy and access to a lot of technology where they could jump up to become a major player. And I would argue this does the exact same thing for Nikon. There's a few major advantages they're going to get out of this. Um, the big thing, I think for a little bit of context, the major news story with Nikon last year was Red suing them about putting compressed <laughs> RAW in their Z9. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, Red's gone after a bunch of companies and they've wound up with the RAW recording being removed. Uh, remember the uh, DJI Ronin, Chris, where yep. we tested it and we were like, this is great. It records ProRes RAW internal. This rules. And then it shipped to market without that functionality <laughs> uh, after Red got uh, sent a strongly worded email, I'm sure. Um, yeah. So who knows exactly what happened behind the scenes if this inspired it. But what it means now is Nikon now has access to, I would argue, the best compressed video codec out in the world. So they're going to be making cameras that shoot extremely efficient raw video. Um, there's no reason for and them they not to can if they own red. Like some folks have the idea that maybe Nikon will be less litigious with this patent. No, they won't. No. Now Nikon owns this patent. <laughs> They've just got a this con is yeah, but they, passive but they, revenue they, they, stream now. Yeah, but they fended off. They they basically won that case, right? They didn't. Uh, the, oh. the details of that it they was settled. essentially yeah. they, settled, they settled. Which my guess okay. is went to well, what if we just acquired you? And Red was like, well, then we wouldn't sue you anymore if you just yeah. went to buy us. <laughs> yeah. So that's likely. I mean, the amount of time it takes to get through an acquisition lines up with how yeah. long it's been since that was dismissed or settled. Quote, and last week. So I yeah. do think it was a major player. I, I mean, no one's ever gonna confirm or deny this but i do think it was a major player in yeah in the acquisition we'll actually wait for this i'm sure they have to because they're a publicly traded company nikon has to say how much this cost at some point i'm very yeah. curious how much they red's not red. a public traded company although maybe that'll change now well, so uh, the, I mean, the this does look at folded into nikon yeah so. yeah so this brings up an interesting question about uh, you know and, and jordan you kind of said it like when sony took over minolta they basically grew their flower out of the corpse of minolta 
right? Like they they made some cameras that obviously were inspired or had the same technology, Straight obviously up the same lens. They Straight had up. the same ping pong sounding yeah. shutter. Yeah. Everything, right? But they quickly transition to dissolve that take the technology grow on it and make their own product so i think some people are wondering like is nikon going to take red and effectively dissolve them to some degree you know we're going to see a lot of the red technology come into nikon cameras i, I would and they all yeah. already make excellent yeah. hybrid cameras so yeah we're going to see those benefits but are they going to keep red going as a separate cinema company it is a different relationship than sony and minolta because sony was trying to be in the same field here now nikon has diversified but that's still an interesting concern is red going to continue are they going to benefit from nikon's technology are they going to take on nikon's lens mount i mean that's a very strange i mean that one seems to me dynamic that's has, a no there's question. no argument there yeah. there will be a yeah. z-mount one nikon therefore needs cinema optics because yes, they don't they do. really have them yeah, no, there's they're shockingly good lenses for video. Like Nikon, second to Panasonic, I'd say. They really prioritize breathing correction. They let you actually flip the direction of their manual focus rings, which is what kept me from using them forever. For so I'm not going to relearn my muscle memory, uh, you know, when every cinema lens in the world focuses. You're the, the same oldest way. of dogs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do think, you know, the Canon question is really interesting because red was very, they were putting RF mounts on their cameras. Suddenly we saw compressed raw appearing in Canon cameras. I'm very worried if you've got like an R5, an R5C, like, okay, Nikon now owns red. Are they going to say like, you know what? No, no more compressed raw. We're not going to renew your- that. Yeah, I'm exactly. sure it's a contract. Don't update the firmware on your R5C and suddenly <laughs> find out it's not shooting compressed raw anymore. Uh, I'd be very concerned about that. Yeah, but yeah, you, they, you have they to do. think Nikon's going to do something to make themselves better and make Canon worse if yeah. they can. Yeah, I can't. There's no reason why they would make Canon better at this point. This no, move is entirely such to an more. antagonistic relationship. Like in <laughs> Canon and Nikon's minds, it's still Canon versus Nikon, which yeah. I think is why they let Sony kind of slip by for a long time. The other thing too is we're talking a lot about like. Like, oh, what could this mean for Nikon cameras? But I'm more interested in what this could mean for RED cameras because mm-hmm. I would say RED has really been losing quite a bit of market share in like high end production. We used to hear, you know, if it's a VFX centric movie, a lot of them were shot on REDs, especially when Aerie didn't have high resolution cameras. Uh, now they do. And Aerie like owns, you look at, you know, the Oscar nominated movies, they're either shot on film or they're shot on Aerie by and large. Um, they right. have really kind of owned that. Cause I've always said, if you're spending enough money to have a crew of a hundred people on set, the cost of the camera doesn't matter. So you might as well standardize it with whatever is the industry standard. This gives red a really interesting niche where they could be the smaller cameras that have Nikon stabilization, Nikon's mm-hmm. very good video autofocus ever since the Z9 and Z8 came out, uh, shooting compressed raw internally right into the camera. If you're doing like, you know, high budget documentary work or low budget filmmaking, suddenly that's really compelling. You don't need a focus puller on set. Um, yeah. And you're getting access to a Z mount that is the most flexible lens mount on the market right now. It's the shortest flange back and the widest mount. But Nikon also gets benefits for their camera. I mean, you know, they're now getting a global shutter, which is interesting. They're getting, yeah. I, you know, the sensor technology, I, I, that's kind of a curious way to go because, I mean, Red do say they make their own sensors, but I, so do Nikon, right? Like, it, it's they're designing them. They're, they're saying this is the spec that we want to have matched, but that's not, they're not making the sensors. So it'll be interesting to see how that relationship does uh, going forward. But yeah, they do have access to interesting sensors now they didn't have access to before. Uh, I yeah, it's going to be positive. I think it's going to be very strong. I just wonder, are they still going to call things like monitor lizards and Gila monsters and Tyrannosaurus? Gila Rexes monsters is a good one. I don't think they've used I, that I one. Sh- they should. I sure hope so. so like, I, I, I'm very. Are we going to have Nikon leopard geckos or something? I don't know. I'm concerned for the ten year old boy who's been naming all their products, <laughs> and they get it because it has to be a ten year old boy, and they're like, okay, we want you to watch last action hero and the 1999 Godzilla and then go name our products. That's the yeah. task that they give this kid. Is he going to be out of work now? Are they just going to call them boring <laughs> conventional product names? Cause that would be a know. real blow. I think <laughs> uh, I, I support that kid. So I'm actually curious what uh, listeners think. Do they think that red will remain an independent brand or will over the next couple of, I don't think it will take very long if they choose to go this, go this route, that those will simply just become Nikon cinema cameras. Um, and 
rename them or they may keep them as they are, but anything newly released will be a Nikon cinema camera. I'm, yeah, I really am not sure what the, what the route will be there. Cause there are many who argue that red has, is not holding the position they once did mainly mm. because Airy is making arguably some people say better cameras than red was making in the digital age. Red was like the first major digital cinema camera and they've simply just not been keeping yeah. up. Yeah. So if Nikon pushes that direction, do you think that they have the chance to actually challenge Aerie? I think Nikon, I personally think Nikon's going to take the red brand and try to really advance the sort of lower to mid range exactly. market. I, I think that's real. I don't think they're going to try to compete with Ari necessarily, n- at least not at the start. So that's who where knows? Canon cinema cameras live, right? Canon and yeah, Bag I think Magic. Nikon wants to destroy Canon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so they just want to own whatever Canon has. And not only that, but let's also remember, like you know, Nikon's done a really good job of making hybrid cameras. I mean, the Z8, I don't think, still gets enough fanfare for how good a video camera it is, but there's a market that's really controlled by Sony and Canon. So I think Nikon definitely wants to play in that field, right? There's a really pushback. Yeah. Their brand yeah. perception has just immediately elevated to every, yeah. you know, DP and assistant camera being like, Oh, red is a actual high end yeah. brand that I trust, you know, because Nikon's never had that flaky. before. They've yeah. never had that before. So now they have their cinema division. I think, I think that's exciting. Yeah. So I the think, last, oh, go, no, ahead, go ahead, No, no, no. I was I, just going to say the way I liken it is uh, Red is the girl that Canon was dating for a little while and they were, you know, oh, dabbling geez. with the lens mount and things. And Nikon has just swooped in, not and only because her. Red makes a lot of sense for Nikon, but also just as a little waving of the middle finger to Canon. Uh, that's my ulterior theory. Oh, man. <laughs> I guess the only thing that really kind of intrigues me then about the naming is if you are going to go to battle with Sony and Canon in their cinema divisions, which I think they are. Yeah. Sony are, are branded Sony's, Canon are branded Canon's. Does Nikon want to go into that arena using the red name or do they want to go into the arena using the Nikon name? And I feel like they probably want to go into that arena using the Nikon name. I so, bet it's going to be a slower transition. I think it'll be like the red, you know, fly mini winged dragon by Nikon. Not not yeah. Nikon blah blah and blah. Slow, blah and not, slowly not. shifted over to the Nikon mm-hmm. blah 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 powered by red. Mm-hmm. Powered and then by eventually red. be just the Nikon whatever. Yeah. And I think they could do that over the course of two to three. Or years. they'll just make the cameras red, right? Like they'll just make them red. They'll that be That would red be cameras. a terrible decision. Any reflective That'd be so surface, cool. you'd see this stupid. They made a red camera, like a red, red camera. Oh, you meant like And everyone was <laughs> like, you have to spray paint this thing black immediately. <laughs> Or it shows up. Yeah, but on every- set, who cares, right? On set, who cares? I no. think it'll mirrors be- and glass on set. So, I mean, red cameras already look very attention grabbing, and they love that. That's what they want them to do. Everybody wants to see them on set and be like, whoa, that's a red, right? Like, battery life is going to be a pain in the ass. Yes. <laughs> uh, what I want to close this discussion on is looking back at what feels like forever, but was really just three years. In January 2021, Nikon was hitting rock bottom. They lost $720 million, the most in their history that year, and were just floundering financially. That was the kick in the pants that turned them around to the point where they are now buying cinema companies. They, it is, I don't think I can... I can't think of another situation in all of tech where a company went from looking as though they may go out of business to being dominant in three years. Ah, uh, you know, I don't know. Well, who knows? Who knows? You know, it's just gen- wild to me. I'm so yeah. like, I, whatever the executives at Nikon did, they just feel different than what most tech companies, especially out of Japan. Yeah. you would feel they have they so are, much swagger right now talking yeah, to like our nikon aggressive. reps and everything like that ever since the z9 is just like yeah it, it feels very like chris and i were there for the d3 d700 era when nikon suddenly caught up technologically to canon in like completely out of the blue very quickly that feels a lot like this right now um, and I think they're taking more advantage of it to future proof things instead of like, hey, we had a great year. Let's just roll with that. They're like, OK, how can we really diversify, which is something they have to do they have very to do. badly. Um, yeah. You know, they're doing sunglasses now, too. We talked about that the other day. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, to ass- just assure that they're still a technological leader, because basically for the last little while, they've been like dependent on, I don't know, what's Sony developing? Mm. 
So, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm cool just time, really man. Impressed. Cool time. Like, yeah. I, I don't know what else to say. Like, this is this is really <laughs> neat. I think the I have never seen people be, like you talk to people at Nikon. They are really proud of working there right now. And yeah. as much as Canon has a perception problem with like how people view them, I think Nikon is the polar opposite. How yeah. people view them. People, everybody right sees them on the upswing. Yeah. You know, that yeah. is kind of the perception. It's, it's right. It's a now. cool place to be. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we'll actually get a red camera to review because we know people. <laughs> so that'd be pretty sweet. And yeah. like red has a studio too. Is it like Nikon studios is going to be a thing that would also, you know, they launch new cameras. Let's go to a sound stage. That'd be badass. I think that sounds neat. We'll see what happens at NAB this year, um, yeah. which is next month. Uh, I'm curious now you how have to go, much. Jen. I, I mean, that's I why they announced it going. so early, right? I mean, they want they definitely want to have a Do you think there's going to be some fanfare? I wonder if they if they moved their booths closer to each other. We can probably find out. There's an exhibition list. It's but, it's all anybody's going to talk about at those booths. Oh yeah. yeah. They've are they right now they've basically already won NAB until somebody comes out with something better. Yep. <laughs> the the other thing too, their co- corporate culture is so different. On a recent episode, we talked about the most ridiculous things we've seen at trade shows, and I talked about when Red was having people tattooing their logos on their bodies to move them up the wait list like that is the most corporate like the opposite <laughs> of nikon's cor- corporate culture having talked to both companies like red is a very bro company i'm wondering how this is going to shake out you know they have a lot of employees too are those people going to stay with nikon who knows yeah crazy all right all right well we'll find out but <laughs> until then what have you guys been up to uh we just had an oscar party that was cool. Chris hosted uh, this year. Yes, I hosted this year. And Do you have food Jordan's, at the, this Oscar party? Do you make Jordan's wife on? won? She destroyed us all uh, with her guesses. So that was good. out of twenty three. That's very impressive. Wow, that's very nice. impressive. But, yeah. uh, but you what mentioned about food. Oh, yeah. Chris brought the thunder this year. Go ahead, Chris. Take take. You know, no, no. I like credit. it when other people ingratiate. Uh, okay, so you know, he, my, he my made this lasagna that was like beef mixed with sausage that was just delightful. Uh, he said there was some red wine that went into the little lasagna, bit of fennel not seed into him. Um, he I was put very, a lot of red wine into me. Very yeah. gregarious uh, at the time we arrived. Um, <laughs> Yeah, great party. Um, and yeah, I've cleaned up. I was very Chris, impressed. I'd like yeah. to have a lasagna throwdown with you at some point. I'll, I'll throw my lasagna down on you anytime. Because uh, I will I, rub my lasagna all over I'm, you. I'll, and, I'll bring and spank you, and, mm, and I'm going to win this what, fight. Not what I was referring that's to. That's not? What, what do you mean by throwdown? That's like, like a wrestling. T- 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 what you- like Jordan will have a blind taste test of which one oh. is better. Yeah, it's got to be blind. That's too. not yeah. nearly yeah. as exciting. Because I feel like he'll feel like he needs to say that yours is better than mine. Chris well, I'm around Chris a lot more than Jaron in yeah. person. Yeah. So I got to keep him. <laughs> and Chris happy. would be very upset if he loses. I'd so be I, insufferable. I, oh, man, I'd bring it up every <laughs> month. I'd be like, oh, oh, you don't like this camera? Like you didn't like my lasagna? <laughs> yeah, I, we have to review do over. Because I think because I think I can win. I don't oh. think so. It was pretty good. I, 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 if I do say so myself, it was I, pretty I have damn the, good. The hist- I have some real Florence history behind me. Like mine is a true recipe from from Italy. So right. I mean, I, I did use ricotta. I know oh, that's see, like that's very. So there's differences among our lasagnas. So yeah, we'll see. I know, but you can't right? say You're anymore make... because Jordan will know which one of us made it. Can we expense a trip to Portland, or uh, are we getting you up here, Jaron, for uh, lasagna? We'll, we'll make we'll make something yeah. happen. We got to be in the same time? room. We, we, I'm sure we're going to go to another event in California at some point, and we both have said that we're tired of eating out the whole time. Oh, let's do an Airbnb and yeah, a we'll full, do an Airbnb yeah. lasagna oh, throwdown. And then, but I mean, there was also a bit of soy sauce in there. There was a bit of Worcestershire sauce in there. I mean, you know, yeah, very yeah, unconventional. Yeah, I, I, we'll I bring see. it. We'll see. Bring okay, it. Um, let's move on to tech support. We've got a lot of questions here today. We're going to listen to a speak pipe first. This is from mm. Max from Ukraine, and this is very directly related to what we just <laughs> talked about. So that's why I put it not up lasagna, the, not lasagna. No, about <laughs> a certain color. And he wants certain, to talk about the. That Oscars. would be strange. Can you imagine if there's lasagna rated speak by? That would be interesting. He wants All to know right, about Gosling. Let's, let's listen. In. <laughs> hey guys, Max from Ukraine here. So I have a question about raw video. I've heard that Red has patents that prohibit manufacturers from letting us record uh, raw video internally on our mirrorless cameras. However, we already have 10-bit video with log profiles, so couldn't we just up that to 12-bit and have 12-bit video with log profiles on our cameras? And would that be any different from 12-bit raw video recorded externally 
to Ninja 5 and other such recorders. In other words, what constitutes raw video? Thanks for your answer uh, in advance and uh, love your podcast. Okay, this is a very common misconception because a lot of people are coming from a photography background where you've got a JPEG with no dynamic range and very minimal ability to edit that uh, compared to a raw file, which gave you you know, the, all the dynamic range that sensor was capable of, the ability to push and pull, white balance and tint as far as you want it. Things are a little bit different in video because raw video takes up so much space, everyone started to try and figure out alternatives to keep file size down, still give you some flexibility. And that's why we saw log video come out. So this is giving you expanded dynamic range compared to like a classic broadcast profile and some ability to shift color by recording a very flat image and letting you saturate it um, yourself. So, so often people are like, well, I need my camera to shoot raw because I want the most dynamic range in it. And honestly, with most of these cameras, you're getting almost the same dynamic range as shooting 10-bit log. A logarithmic curve can encode as much as a 14-bit raw image. The big difference when you need raw video is, do you really want to push and pull color? Uh, that's a huge part of it. Or if you want to key things, you know, if you're doing high end like green screen work, you know, uh, say you're doing a Marvel movie where it's all going to be composite and in post, that's where it's very effective for that. And what? They're not real? <laughs> I just broke Chris's brain. <laughs> um, what? Or do you really want control over noise reduction and sharpening? Because uh, you're getting the actual image right off the sensor. You determine how much detail you want, you know, as a trade-off with the amount of noise that you want. That's where you really see it. So for the majority of productions, and we're really seeing this when you talk about cameras shooting on Aries, not a lot of them are shot in Aerie Raw unless it's for VFX work. It's so often like it's recording ProRes with a log profile uh, is a very common workflow for that because you're still getting access to bags of dynamic range. Um, bags. So, bags. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do think it's very cool that we're going to, like Red Raw is incredibly efficient, uh, and it's actually quite easy to edit. You don't need a beast of a computer. I remember six years ago when I was shooting a short film on the Red Dragon, and Chris, you were there. We were going through dailies on a laptop, and this is an old Intel yep. MacBook, um, playing it in real time, which is nuts. Um, so you wow, think of actually, how far we've it's come. It's very impressive because yeah. that computer's not very yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, compare that to like, you know, <clears throat> Canon's raw format or Nikon's, which still demands some horsepower for sure uh, when you're editing those. Uh, so that's a very cool thing. It's going to make raw video more accessible, but don't feel like you absolutely need raw video no. to get good dynamic range, good color, things like that. Log video has come a huge way. You know, I was shooting recently on a Z8 in a high contrast scene. I'm like, I'm just going to shoot N log. It's got tons of dynamic range and I'll be able to push the color exactly to where I need it to. You know, if yeah, I'm I doing mean, a you, film with special effects, sure, I'll shoot raw for it, but I'm also paying for You basically for never shoot raw. Yeah. yeah. There's no po point shooting raw for our show. I mean, you never do it unless we're testing uh, specifically the raw on the camera. So yeah, it's... When, uh, yeah, when this came up, Chris, I got a little nostalgic and I was like, have we ever shot raw, like red raw for our show and there is one time i'm curious if you can recall what that was of course i can't i don't even remember what we did three weeks ago i what was that a lens i don't know it was a canon i think i i don't know no, were we in red germany raw, red code raw we shot that when we were making a dating video for levi hall <laughs> Oh, our dear friend uh, on an episode comparing some lights. We went and pulled yeah. out the fan, shot everything red raw. Uh, you should definitely check that out. If you yeah, get a chance. because we know that women respond to accurate color. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that was what, why would I remember Levi's dating profile video as the one thing we shot in raw? That's uh, all right. Thanks guys. So the next one is another speak pipe. This one is from Nick. Let's listen in. Hello all. Love the podcast and look forward to listening every week. I currently have a full setup of Nikon Z gear, Nikon Z8, a couple PF lenses, 85-1.2 that I use primarily for portraiture and wildlife slash, slash nature photography. I continue to be attracted to the computational features of the OM slash Olympus cameras, such as Live ND, Grad ND, Live Comp, etc., and I find myself questioning if these computational features are enough to spend the money on another camera, specifically the OM-1 Mark II, and a couple lenses to go with that. Uh, I do have the comparable focal lengths, comparable weight, and better light gathering with my Nikon system, but 
miss the computational features of the OM system cameras. I know this question is hypothetical, but as technology and full frame cameras improve, I'm wondering if slash when you all believe computational features like live and D, grad and D, et cetera, will be engineered into full frame cameras in the future, specifically Nikon Z series cameras. Thanks for exploring this fun hypothetical with me and sharing your thoughts on the future of computational photography and cameras. And of course, thanks for all that you do. It is a fun hypothetical, Nick. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you're not crazy. The computational features in the OM system cameras are very useful. I actually really do find them quite useful. It's nice not having to bring filters. It's nice not having to bring a tripod in some situations. Uh, I think that is an effective tool. And I would absolutely love to see it come to other mounts. So for me to answer your first question, is it worth doing it? I think... If you're, if you're the kind of person that wants like a more compact camera setup that you can take in the field where you don't have to bring a lot of stuff, if that'd be a real big benefit to you, then yes, I think that's exciting. If that's not really something you do, then uh, as enjoyable as it is, I don't think it's necessarily worth getting a whole other system. But at the same time, I would love to see it come to full frame cameras. I would love to see it come to manufacturers other than OM system. And the real challenge is, can we get sensors that read out fast enough? Enough. In full frame, yes, we're getting there, especially with Nikon. But can we also get the processing power to to process those bigger files and do it properly? And that's and and the software. I mean, you have to have the back end to support it too. But there, there's another. I think that's the challenge. Another piece in there too that I was reminded yeah. of recently, and that's that OM system owns patents. Yeah, that's yes. what. I, that's kind of where I wanted to. Like a lot of there's some cool image stacking stuff you can do to improve image quality, and that's part of how they're giving you. You know, in some cases, like handheld high res, you're getting basically full frame DR and image quality on those, uh, but with multiple shots. It's some of the other stuff, like you know the where it's building the image in the live bulb mode or live ND. You know, those are yeah. the things, especially that I really love that uh, we haven't seen on any other cameras, and I do strongly suspect there's some patents there, and that's why. Yeah, I think uh, I got my question answered for me. I couldn't remember who told me this while I was in Japan, but it was like the reason Sony's A9 three requires you to use like their really bad computer software to do <laughs> any of their computational stuff is because they can't do it in camera because of a pattern. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, I think <laughs> it's tough. Wow. I, I want to see more computational things. I actually have a story that I'm working on for this week where um, one of the companies I spoke to just says they don't even think photographers want it, which is a whole yeah, other that's crazy. thing. So I'm, uh, we'll talk about that maybe in the future, but yeah, like in addition to maybe they're not sold that it's necessary, they don't see the it as a viability because they can't. Yeah, or it, it could, yeah. It sounds like I think a lot of the manufacturers just say this stuff because they can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're like, no one wants it. Of course, it's like not, nobody we wants don't have us access to. to it. Yeah, why would we want to? We don't want to even. It's like, well, uh, yeah, no, yeah. You, you do. You do want to. It's very useful technology, and uh, I do hope we start to see this move out through the ecosystem that would be really useful very useful um all right so the next one is an email we got and i forwarded you guys the pictures so i don't know if you actually got a chance to look at them but we do yep. need to have some show and tell time here uh, i'll put them up on screen <laughs> for those who are watching on youtube and i will describe it as best i can for those who are listening to audio only but this one is from amaro and they emailed us and said a couple days ago I went for a late winter hike in my nearby New Hampshire mountains. I took along my X-T5 with a few lenses, including my Rokinon 12 millimeter with an ND filter and tripod to try for some waterfall long exposures. Chris loves waterfall long exposures. I do. I do love them. <laughs> On one of the prettier waterfalls I came across, I ended up shooting into the sun, stopping down to try and get some of those sun stars Chris is always going on about. Isn't that name redundant, by the way? A sun yeah. star. <laughs> Five okay. observational points for yeah. that. Well done. And I took a bunch of shots <laughs> with a range of exposures from times from 15 <laughs> seconds to two minutes. Two minutes is a really long exposure. I'm looking at my pictures later and notice something interesting in the two minute exposures. In the bottom of the frame in the shadows, you can actually see the 12 millimeter lettering, which is printed along the inside border of the lens's front element. 
Sure enough, if you look at the shorter exposures and pull them up a few stops, you can faintly see the lettering. I just thought this was funny and curious about why exactly this happens. Any idea how to avoid it in the future when using an ND filter? Would a lens hood or some additional kind of filter do anything? <laughs> or should I just not worry about it since it's in the extreme situation and frankly, the shorter exposures are better and not even that noticeable in those? I figured they'd be better. Right. Two minutes is a long time and you're not getting much benefit <laughs> out of that. Thanks, big fan of your podcast and y'all's work. So I put the pictures up as I was reading that and uh, right. you don't really see it in the, the 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 full image but when they zoom in you can definitely yeah. you can see it in the rocks yeah. there <laughs> very I cool think you I don't see this very often I, I, it's internal reflection off the ND filter I'm sure yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. and and the easy fix honestly is black out the letters uh, whether that be oh, with some you know, tape? if you want to go extreme with a sharpie but yeah, I mean even just black gaffer tape and you can cover them up um, but yeah you even see some manufacturers actually do insist on black uh, black lettering if they are going to put it on the inside ring to avoid said problem. But again, it's something that's so rare you would not normally see it except in these very long exposures. You could toy around with different ND filters, but the fix to just black out the letters is so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do want to point out I've ran into this issue as well. When we were shooting uh, yeah. the short film, A Walk Down to Water, we actually had panes of glass that we were shifting in front of the lens to create some interesting reflections. And you definitely saw the lettering on there. Chris's uh, idea of yeah. blacking it out will absolutely fix that issue. You can still get reflection from the sun bouncing off the front element um, and then back uh, against the glass. So one fix that I did find for that is most of your lenses, if you're doing a very long exposure at an incredibly small aperture, focus a little bit past infinity. All your lenses are going to give you this option to do it on a 12 millimeter. Infinity is like a foot away. Uh, throw that <laughs> lens a little bit further and you'll actually get less of the reflection that's very close and actually your depth the field is picking that up uh, you can throw it past there as well that's a trick it's not going to eliminate it but it'll now turn into a blur instead of uh, very clear lettering Little right fix. Yeah. most importantly sunstar is maybe a redundant term uh, but what do you suggest otherwise uh spiky sun sparklies ball. spiky ball S the mace sun spike the sun mace is excellent on this sun lens. mace okay great yeah i, I will say mace. that sun star is not recognized as a word by any of the uh no. the correctors that we use so. i still have no idea how you want me to write that in the articles one word two words capitalized i have no idea what you want me to i'm do just, just rolling with whatever you put in there <laughs> all right but yeah sun morning star you could but that's redundant <laughs> again all right, so we're moving on. Uh, this is another speak pipe. This one is from Martin. Hello, guys. Quick question here. I have been trying to upgrade to mirrorless, and I have three options in mind. The Sony A7R 3 the Sony X6700, or the Fujifilm X-H2. The question is, I like to crop a lot. Um, I do architecture, landscapes, and some occasional um, wildlife. So considering that the cameras are going to be basically the same price and it would cost me exactly the same to upgrade to any mirrorless system of the three that I, um, I'm choosing between, what should I get from your uh, perspective? Thank you. These are such tough questions, Martin, because uh, we have to go by the criteria that you're providing is most important to you. And obviously, if you crop a lot, the key thing is going to be megapixels. You want as many megapixels as possible. So, you know, something like the A7R3, certainly the X-H2 to some degree, that that would be advantageous uh, if that's something you like to do a lot. But then there's so much more to be considered as far as speed of focus, speed of shooting, what kind of photography you want to do, that kind of thing. Well, this is architecture, landscape, and occasional wildlife. So two out of the three of those aren't moving much. Yeah. Um, no, but one of them moves a lot. Yeah, but he said yeah. occasional. So if, if based on what he's provided... We have to go with the things that he's shooting the most of, which aren't moving. Yeah. Uh, my, my look at it is basically the 67 is your best wildlife camera. The A7R3 is your best landscape architecture camera. The X-H2 is a really nice sweet spot there. I'd say it's yeah. a better focuser than the A7R3 uh, and still gets you some nice detail. Uh, but my, if you're primarily doing architecture landscape, go A7R3 and then you're still, the autofocus might not be as sophisticated as modern systems, but you'll still be able to get some wild yeah life. and dynamic range is excellent and yes that sensor you can crop. that sensor is fantastic yeah and you can crop a lot yeah all right moving on this is an email from action jd hey guys love the show i am a photographer who photographs birds and wildlife i live in savannah georgia the Beautiful. weather here 
The major- it's a very beautiful city. I love, I love Savannah. Yeah. The weather here the majority of the year is humid and warm except for a couple of months. A common problem with long distance wildlife shooting is heat haze or refraction. I am currently using a Canon R7 with a 100 to 400 millimeter RF lens and a 1.4x teleconverter for about nice 900 set. millimeters field of view. Yeah. I use the zoom in feature of the camera, but sometimes it's still not enough to tell how sharp a photo will be. Is there any device that can be used to measure or verify the amount of refraction to prevent wasting time shooting photos in poor conditions? Thanks for your help. This is very specific. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't know of such a device personally, other than the human brain and eyeball uh, with with uh, looking through the EVF and zooming in. I mean, yeah, I don't know what else you could really do as far as like a tool to tell you if there's heat haze. Yeah, the, the there's big, always heat haze. The big thing, uh, well, first of all, I started looking into this to see if there was a device, and it took me to NASA technical papers, and I realized right. I'm a big dumb <laughs> dummy. Um, so that isn't the solution. So my thing is yeah. don't look for sharpness when you're zooming in to check. Look for movement. If you have the camera locked off, put your lens to the maximum magnification and point it as far as you can, uh, the closest to infinity possible. If you're seeing movement, that means your sharpness will be impacted. You got your heat haze. Yeah, uh, that's the yeah. way that I can quickly test for it because honestly, viewfinder resolution punched in varies wildly camera to camera. So um, yeah. that's a better way. Just look for movement. You could also but, I mean, camp, camp out till about 2.30 or 3 p.m. right yeah. after that afternoon rainstorm clears a lot of that humidity and right in that right after that you might have better luck yeah. you're gonna get heat haze though i mean I, there's different things too right when we're talking about like we're talking about sort of refract we're talking about heat creating all the wobblies and the light waves but also it could just be moisture in the air fog that kind of stuff that you're talking about atmospherics uh unfortunately there's no way to to test that even looking through the viewfinder i mean you kind of really notice it afterwards. Just, yeah, I don't know. Now we got D Hayes, D Hayes slider. That's cheating. There you go. It, it does help. I, I want to, this is slightly unrelated, but I was just listening to a WTF podcast with Rodrigo Prieta, the DP on uh, killers of the flower moon. We talked about it last week, how he shot that sequence of the people during the fire. And he said something I, that never occurred to me. He's like, we set up the shot. It looked like garbage until my focus puller accidentally focused on the heat haze. And that's how they pulled off that really cool look. So now I'm going to go out. I'm just focusing on <laughs> waves of haze. That's all I'm doing until I can create something that beautiful. Yes. That's my new challenge. But that's not myself. a solution for you. This is not a solution for you at all. I just thought it was no. fascinating and wanted to a talk related, about it. Related thing. Yeah. 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 All right. Two more. This one is a speak pipe again. This one is from Scott. Hey, Petapixel. My name is Scott, and I have a question for you guys. I love to go on adventure travel trips every year. And so far, I've been traveling and hiking with my Sony a7R 3 and two lenses. I have a Sony GM 24-70, the new model, and an older Sony GM 16-35. They've been great lenses since I skew towards landscape photography. However, I'm planning to take some trips to South America and Africa, where I think I'll be more interested in run and gun wildlife shots. Therefore, I want your opinion. Should I buy a Sony 70 to 200 GM2 or opt for the slower but f- f- slower but longer Sony GM 100 to 400? Also, should I get a teleconverter? Thanks guys. Appreciate it. I mean, good choice on the uh, excellent lenses. You got the second version of the 24 to 70. That's a great move. Um my my general thought pattern would always be go more distance, you know, especially it, obviously in decent light. I, even with an A7R three, even in poorer light, it's going to be fine. I wouldn't be put off by the slower 100 or 400, and you absolutely want the range. I'd even want further. At the same time, though, you kind of mentioned it there. 70 to 200 GM2 with a teleconverter will basically give you the same versatility as the 100 to 400 at distance, and then it all and it's it is sharp. That setup is good. There's no I wouldn't worry about the the, the downsides of using teleconverter there. And then you have the versatility of a very fast 70 to 200 for doing close in work, but even more so like, you know, portraits of local people or, you know, anything like that. Indoor shooting. 70 low to 200 light. is also one of my favorite landscape. Lenses. It's a great lens and it's easy to carry, like, you know, and, and any sort of night. How good 200 yeah. is for landscapes. Yeah, absolutely. And any sort of low light wildlife photography where you can maybe get closer, although in Africa, I don't know how close you want to get. Um, 
the 7200 be a, a good option. So that with the teleconverter, I feel would be more versatile than just the 100 to 400. But regardless, I would normally default to whatever gives me the biggest focal range. Yeah, I, I would go 70 to 2 with the teleconverter for that extra light, like Chris mentioned. Also, that is a very good close up lens if you want to do some detail shooting as well, which the yeah. 1 to 4 is not fantastic for. But yeah, I totally agree with uh, Chris. Good job, babe. And it, oh, thanks, uh, Jordy <laughs> Boo. I appreciate that. And, and it, I mean, it's, it's a light lens, like it's quite compact, quite easy to carry. So it's not a pain to carry at all. Good job, right. Jordy Boo. Last one What's is up, from. <laughs> Last one is from Sharuz. It's another speak pipe. Hello. I have a question about what camera to buy. I'm looking, f- is it worth buying a camera now or is it at this, at this time of the year or is it best to wait and see what Fuji and Canon bring out? I'm looking for an all round camera which can do travel, uh, street photography, landscapes. And money is no object. What would you recommend? Um, should I go Fuji GFX 102 or R5 or Nikon Z8 or just wait a couple of months and see what comes out before the Olympics? Thank you. Mm. I feel like this this idea of like waiting for the latest and greatest and chasing that is it's just a never ending escalator. Yeah, if you've been waiting for the R1 to buy a camera, you haven't taken a picture in four years. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, it you got to go with what you think you'll enjoy based on excellent reviews by the many people who do them, including Chris and Jordan. But uh, or just Chris or just Chris and Jordan. Don't worry about the other reviews. Just (laughs) Petapixel, Chris and Jordan. Um, Jaren, baby, come on! Don't. (laughs) Uh. Um, What do you guys think? Am I am I crazy? I I just don't. I don't personally like waiting for the next big thing. I don't do that with smartphones. I don't do it with cameras. You know, and Sharuz is asking a question, which is tough because it's very open-ended. We get these a lot. Uh, money is no object. That's great. But I mean, like GFX 102 is a wildly different camera than an R5 yeah. or a Z8. And so, you know, it sounds like your interests are fairly uh, broad, which is great. You know, travel, street photography, landscapes, money is no object. But I mean, of the three that you're listing, a Z8 would probably be my choice just because we are getting... I mean, the R5 is good too, but I feel like the Z8 is a more full-feature camera. Of the Excellent cameras he's dynamic. mentioned, the R5 is the longest in the tooth. That's and most, what I was going to say. I really expect that we'll see an update on that. Like, yeah. right. uh, Comparing it to the recent, uh, like the R6 II and R3 uh, on some recent shoots, I really felt the difference when I jumped yeah. back to the R5. Mm-hmm. But again, like, what's the R5 II going to be like? I mean, nobody knows. That's the hard thing to say. So, Canon, Canon I would say GFX. Stuff that is madness that I don't think is happening at yeah. all. Yeah. Canon, you know, and an R1, been... like, I mean, the Olympics might reveal the R1, hopefully, that we'll see that, you know, if they're even going to call it that. But I don't think that would be a great camera for you personally. I don't, without even knowing what it does, <laughs> I mean, that's a tool that's going to be made specifically for yeah. journalism, if the sports alpha one, and action. It, like if the A1 and the A93 are not of interest to you now, then the R1 won't be either. Right. You know, and, and for travel and street photography, I'd personally want something a little bit slow, like not slower, a little bit smaller, lower key, a little bit more discreet, uh, a little bit lighter, frankly. So, uh, you know, uh, from what you're choosing here, Shadows, I think the Z8 would probably be your best choice. But as Jaren said, yeah, you can't really bank on what's going to come out in the future. Otherwise, you'll be waiting a turn. Yeah, you'll never, you'll never buy anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I think the Z8 is the most versatile camera. I really, yeah. really yeah. like that camera. Yeah, like yeah. a lot. So sure, Great I'm all, camera. I'm all about it. I think that's a good recommendation. Uh, yeah. And I don't think Nikon will have anything this year that would make you feel like no, you no. missed out. No, and Nikon. we traveled with Z8 that to Idaho. <laughs> it was perfect. Yeah. I don't think we're getting a, a Z8 too, <laughs> or next year. Okay. That's it. Let's move on to never read the comments where I read every comment. But this. condolences, man. <laughs> it's, a, it's a war zone in there sometimes. But I did pick out a few that I wanted uh, you guys to talk about. This one is from A.A. Wrong. I'm sure it's supposed to be something else, but I want to say it like the key. Aaron G. Deal. Maybe or yeah, A.A. Wrong. A.A. Wrong. <laughs> yeah, so A.A. Wrong said, why don't camera companies use the arc amount? They like, you know, Sigma. And does Tamron do it? Well, uh, yeah. So, are we talking? Are we talking uh, on, the talking on the lens? Or are we yeah. talking on the body itself? Like on the lens mount. On the lens. Yeah. A little collar. 
the thing yeah. that you like and, and I, I complain about this all the time. It's a great question. Why don't they? I mean, it's just a dovetail cut. It can't be that hard to machine. It'll make and your lenses is- lighter because there's less mouth yeah, yeah. metal. <laughs> But, you know, I mean, yeah, does everybody use arc amounts? No, but like 95.6% of us do. So, you know, like I've heard that argument and, on there. Like, well, not everybody wants it. Like, you still have to put another shoe on the bottom anyways, right? Yeah, if it is exactly. different from arc amount. So it might as well just be an arc amount because most just gimbal heads are that anyways. Yes. Yeah. So it drives me crazy when they don't uh, do that. And You know what? Uh, I will put it on my list of questions the next time I talk to an executive. Why aren't, are there no dovetail mounts? on your lens collars. And it's Canon, Nikon, and Sony. It's the big three because even like OM lenses have the dovetail cut. Does Fujifilm? Yeah. Uh, Fujifilm does, yeah, on the 200, the the Great White Sharp. Okay. So it's I don't just know the, if they do on any of their three. other Super Tellies. I'd it it seems that. to be really like it's a surprise every single time. It, it, it's not like there's any consistency. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Mm. Another interesting note, sort of a side sidebar on this. Um, I mean, you know, I love my guns, and uh, I actually noticed uh, when I was when I was shopping around and stuff for wow, stuff. What's that? Our subscriber numbers just oh okay. Oh what <laughs> went up? Uh, no, but Arc Mount, it's interesting those it never used to be a thing in the rifle shooting or target shooting field but now it's huge because they're they're all using the same tripod head so even other what my point is whether you like it or not even other industries are now you uni- using arca swiss mount as a universal mounting system so we're seeing this coming out on spotting scopes and mounting plates and all this kind of stuff and i just thought that was really funny because i always thought it was a photographic limited thing and now it's becoming even more universal than we think so I feel like you've told this story before i haven't to me. I haven't. That oh, seems like an off mic conversation, but yeah. not to the world. All right. Next one is from uh, Nick Hill. They ask, how long were you there trying to get a bird to land on your hand in near oh. a one, 100 to 300 video? These I use my princess are powers. starving. To no, <laughs> it has been I, another cold snap that was unexpected. They came back and they're no. bummed out. <laughs> I have princess powers. I have Disney princess powers. Don't take that away from me, Jordy Boo. Sorry, had nothing what, to, what was your princess again? I'm trying to... Oh, you're uh, Rapunzel. Okay. Rapunzel. You your Rapunzel yeah, powers. birds love Rapunzel. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just put up my hand uh, like a princess and then they flock to me because they they feel my inherent goodness and warmth and, and kind nature. And, Jordan, what uh, actually happened? Uh, so no, it's if That's you, exactly if you hold happened. out your finger for any length of time in that park, uh, they will land because they're used to like some people will go. We don't approve of this and feed the birds uh, out in that area. So mm. the birds know that they're going to get food. Don't do no. that. It's bad. I am not approving that at all. But it was neat when I was filming and a bird landed on my head. And I'm annoyed that we didn't get a photo of that because it was probably <laughs> very cute. Yeah. <laughs> So you were waiting. I used my prince. I used my prince's powers to have that bird land on his head. Uh, you know, it's anyways. It's not. They're not trained. Thanks, babe. Okay. Ugh. Next one is from Hourglass Hours, which I kind of like. Yeah. Why I really don't you- mind you calling me babe? I think that's cute. I like it. <laughs> Let's just keep going. With it. Why would you shoot <laughs> almost everything at f four, Chris, on a lens that is an f two point eight? How dare dare you? I? Yeah. What's How dare that? I? And especially on a lens that is excellent at f2.8. So to give context, we were testing the new uh, 100 to 300, which is a f2.8 Canon L series. I mean, it's an incredibly versatile professional lens, incredibly sharp at 2.8. No reason not to shoot it at 2.8, except that I'm the one taking the pictures. And if I want to use a different aperture, I damn well will. So, you know, I <laughs> there's... <laughs> Like I, 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 like I hate this stuff, and and I and I get it. It's like, look, you know, especially at DP Review, we were we were absolutely shooting a lot of technical tests, and you know, and and people are always saying, I won't mention the people because there's lots of people. I was like, oh, you know, people want to see this at two point eight. They want to see, and like I get that. that. Was me. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I get that from a technical standpoint, but from an artistic standpoint, I don't always want to. You know, I'm shooting hockey. Uh, I want a little bit more depth of field. I want a little bit more leeway. The light was decent in that Olympic oval. It's not like a like an amateur, um, you know, neighborhood rec center skating rink. I mean, it's got great lighting. So I'm like, I can afford to go to F4, get a little bit more de- detail, enhance my chances, getting a shot in focus and getting some coverage for the for extra distance. And so that's a creative choice I make and I'm allowed to make that. And and I don't want to feel like I have to shoot always at the aperture just for, for technical reasons so that you guys can see the sharpness at 2.8 all the time. And frankly, I did shoot some photos at 2.8. <laughs> And and uh, 
we, I, I, we you had those samples results. too. We have flare shots. We have bokeh tests. Yeah. We have loca tests. Everything that you would want to know how the lens performs at 2.8. Chris did shoot those when he got to the hockey game. Chris likes to see more like uh, multiple players, a little bit more context. I understand that. Um, you yeah. know, am I still the person who's like, we need more wide open shots every time I get something? Ugh. Absolutely. Cause I'm an annoying person and Chris has to yeah. deal with that. Absolutely. But I understand I, I, his creative intent in this situation and, uh, and <laughs> I look how say, angry he's getting. So stop. Asking. One you of know, the I things- just, it's like, look, I'm not, I, <laughs> how do I, how do I put this? How do I put this? Like, yeah, I, I I absolutely want to provide a service to everybody who watches our, our videos. And I think I do. At the same time, as a photographer, I want to shoot photographs. And I think that's fair as well. And so I will make creative decisions. And and sometimes I, I will even make mistakes on things. I'll be like, oh, crap, I didn't notice I was still at that ISO. And you know what? That's I'm human. That's what we all do. You know what I mean? doesn't mean the photo's no good, right? I mean, I, I feel mm. like it's important to judge lenses technically. <laughs> Shut up. It's important to judge lenses on their technical ability, but it's also important to just appreciate photographs. That's, I think, what I want to mention is that you are not given a requirement for how many pictures you have to take. You don't have to, you're not given a requirement on what you have to shoot at. You're just told to go use a camera and enjoy it and give your opinions on it. And And I will tell you, previously, having to shoot like... 30 or 40 pictures to really evaluate. I mean, I shoot a lot of photos to evaluate the lens, but having to to not just shoot, but show 30 or 40 photos and let people download those raws and have access to that stuff, I get the benefit there. But honestly, from a creative standpoint, it was largely soul crushing because I'm out there shooting and I'm not thinking about the subject matter very much. I'm not thinking about what's interesting me. I'm not going, go, you know, as a photographer, you walk on the streets, you go with what I want to see next, what I feel like shooting, what I'm inspired to shoot. No, I'm going down thinking like, oh, will this chain link fence be a good loca test? Like, oh, do we have enough sharpness tests? Have we fully evaluated the flare examples and stuff? And and that's honestly, creatively, it's, it's soul crushing. It's not fun to do. So I think there has to be an important balancing act, at least for me to function as a human being, absolutely has to be. And so I feel like I still tried to do that for you guys and we try to evaluate stuff. We have, you know, pulled a little bit back on the technical to also show more about just the creative. And I think I, I think that's a better format. Me me too. Okay. Uh last and there's two- test charts at two eight and f four and stop down for like Jaron, you're gonna have to run the uh, limiter a little bit there. Are we recording uh, this 32 bit? Because that might have clipped. <laughs> um I'm gonna let Chris uh Calm cool down. down a little bit. Great. I've got here's one, Chris. <laughs> this should make you feel better. This is right. from Baihu, and they say, I think this is on your SL3 video. I think these right. may be Chris's best photos of any review so far. There you go. They love your pictures. I absolutely appreciate that comment, Baihu. I don't necessarily agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I absolutely appreciate that. I'm glad you enjoyed them. Uh, actually, it's funny. We've been getting a lot of those comments on a lot of our latest videos where it's like, oh, I think this is the best stuff. You know, Jordan gets those too. They're like, oh, I think this is the best frame you've ever shot. And and I'm like, I think Jordan shot better frames, but that's still nice to hear. Like, <laughs> I think you know what I mean? I mean he would pictures. agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel like the pictures you got in Idaho are actually the best you've taken since I've known yeah, you. Those are pretty good. But you know, this is but I really appreciate the nice comments because that does mean a lot. And it it certainly means a lot because you're you're playing to the creative side of what I'm trying to do as opposed to just the technical, which we just which I just went on a rant yeah, about. Yeah. So thank okay. you by Bring your heart rate down. Last Germany one. Is very pretty. Jordan, you, you're gonna answer this one. Chris can sit there and he can breathe for a minute and, and rock back and Honestly, forth. Honestly, the light in Vetzlar wasn't that pretty this time. Yeah. So looked a little you know, overcast. You work with what you work with. Um, on that video, there were more than a couple comments mm-hmm. <laughs> that Chris's lips were blue. Yes, and I—I I, I mean, it did kind of go with the exhausted slash like drained. Oh yeah, no, that situation. was a cre- that was a creative choice on my part. No, How are my lips right not. now? Why were his lips blue? <laughs> Okay, so um, <laughs> so I, I could say, yes, it was a creative decision um, to show that Chris had very little oxygen moving uh, through <laughs> his head. Uh, but I, no, we, we, I decided to shoot that sequence in log because it was very high contrast in the trees there. And this is a brand new camera. I used the existing 
uh, Leica L log to 709 conversion LUT when I was processing that, which was doing some weird stuff to the magenta. And I went and tried to manually fix that. Jaron caught an example is like, hey, his uh, lips look a little blue here. I went and fixed that one clip manually, but there were other ones that I <laughs> did not see uh, when I was yeah. going through there. It was a pretty tight turnaround on that. And uh, yeah, I missed it and it'll be fixed. I'm sure by the time the camera hits retail, there'll be a production lot available for you yes. and you will not have weird blue lips and also any red shirts in that as well. I had to manually <laughs> rekey and make it a wow. normal color. So hmm, uh, nice. yeah, this is a, this is why you want an official supported LUT. We've run into that other times with like the OM one when it first came out, the LUT didn't work very well. Uh, Nikon Z nine. Uh, yeah, wait till you have an approved yeah. LUT for that. Or maybe just don't shoot a lot of log before a camera is launched, which is a lesson I will take to heart now. <laughs> and I, I do not have low oxygen levels. I do not have a medical condition that is causing my lips to turn blue. Although I do appreciate the comments where people say, hey, I think that you might be dying. Yeah. Uh, what was happening to his eyes? That is not a result of the grade. Those were visible bags under his eyes because <laughs> he was not sleeping. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, nothing to do with the color. Yeah, the jet lag was fierce on that one. It was rough. Okay, that's it. That's the episode. Uh, anyone who has been an astute listener and listens every week will know that we've threatened to have a, uh, a guest for like two straight weeks. One of them was my <laughs> mistake because I got scheduling wrong. The other ones we had a scheduling uh, Change, problem. Yeah. yeah, so we had to move. So if everything goes as planned, there will be guests in the next couple of weeks three uh, weeks even we got guest yeah. guest guest yeah guest, so guest, there, guest. there will be people who will come in talking about cool stuff uh so there's that so anyway thanks you all yeah. for joining us we'll uh thanks catch you next week thanks babe if, thanks, if i want to shoot at f4 i will <laughs> <laughs>